So today we're talking about 28 Day Reset, uh, which is a big part of the book. And the reason we're talking about this today is we're going to join you on this journey to do it together. So you're not alone in this. But let's start by talking about why reset? Why 28 days? Is this a lot of work? Like, what's the real deal? We'll get into the details now. So I have not done your 28 day reset yet. I did read the book. I read it. Um, and I'm really excited to try it, but I have a bunch of questions before I even start. So I'm going to ask you some of those, unless you want to give me a little intro into what to expect, but I have a billion questions. Why are we yeah. doing the reset in the first place? All of us, in spite of our best effort to stay healthy, we all struggle with things like brain fog, fatigue, poor sleep, stress, um, some gut issues. And it just happens because life has ups and downs. So the reset is a way to bring our body back to balance. And we do that intentionally from time to time. So the idea of reset really comes from the ancient Ayurvedic principle of Panchakarma. Our daily diet and lifestyle um, causes us to have some wear and tear. We take time to, you know, get a tune-up for our car and we up upload our, you know, upgrade our technology from time to time. So the idea is we do the same thing for our body. We take time every year to really focus on detox and rejuvenation. It's not that we wait to get sick or feel terrible before you do it. The idea is that when you feel these smaller symptoms, not small in the sense that um, they don't affect our quality of life in the sense of not showing up on blood tests just yet. So we want to catch them early on and use this as like a check engine light and pay attention to it and not just ignore it. So that's what the reset is all about. Okay. Cause usually when I've done like a cleanse or something, I've done it after I come back from vacation or I'm like, oh gosh, I need to lose weight for this event or like I need to, you know, so something, something drastic has to happen for me to commit to a cleanse so how is so do you so it sounds like you recommend doing this sort of on a routine a couple of times a year like how would you recommend that because it's not like when everything kind of hits the fan now you do it it sounds like it's just like a maintenance yeah so it can be both so we're all at different points in our health journey so if you are someone like me you know if i go to italy i'm eating all the pasta so when i come back i do the 28 day reset or if I'm trying to get ready for a wedding, if I want to look good in a bathing suit for the summer, whatever the incentive is, the idea is that we can use a 28 day reset to help us get there. And then it's not just a one-time thing. That's what I'm trying to emphasize is that let's not forget about it, right? Once we get into that summer body, once we look good for that wedding or lose those few pounds, let's keep to it. Let's maintain our health year after year by doing the 28 day reset as part of our annual sort of ritual. That's really the ultimate goal. So my next question is, how hard is it? <laughs> because 28 days sounds like it can be a lot depending on how hard it is. So yeah, 28 days is long, but let me tell you the actual detox part where you're really going all in, is really the main, like the seven days, one week. The way 28 day reset is broken down is that the first week is preparation. We're easing into the detox. Week two is the actual detox. Week three is we are easing out of the detox and reintroducing some of the foods and things we've taken out. And week four is when we reap all the benefit. That's when we actually start the rejuvenation process. So the way I break it down is that it's not going to take more than 30 minutes of your day every day to focus on your self-care and do the 20 day reset. So okay. 30 minutes, if that sounds like a lot, let me tell you. We do lots of things in the day that either charge our battery or drain our battery, right? Things that make us energize or thing that just makes us anxious or overwhelmed. So the idea is that we're taking those 30 minutes. We're not coming up with extra 30 minutes in our day because none of us have, you know, we don't have extra 30 minutes in our day. The idea is that we are not doing things that drain our battery. For example, looking at our phone on social media or watching those Netflix shows at night. If we take 30 minutes from something like that and take that to focus on our well-being, that's what 28 Day Reset is all about. We're just reallocating our time, energy, and effort to focus on ourselves. So it's not an extra thing on your plate. If anything, to be honest, it will actually give you more time in your day. It will actually give you more energy throughout your day. So it's not about doing more. 28 Day Reset is all about doing less. That's reassuring. <laughs> so it sounds like phase two or like the second week is 
probably going to be a bit of the most challenging weeks uh, or the, the week that's most challenging, but the other ones are okay. Not too bad. Yeah, it's just about getting used to the idea of prioritizing our self-care. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we're not used to doing that, right? We're just that's go, true. go, go. So this is all about being intentional and saying, wait a minute, for 28 days, I'm prioritizing my self-care, my physical, mental, spiritual health, and I'm trying new things. So we have to give ourselves some breathing room to be able to introduce new concepts of diet and lifestyle and just spend some time thinking about how am I using my time and energy every single day? And how can I do that differently over the course of 28 days? So it's a lot about self-exploration, learning, and experimenting as well. And you already kind of mentioned what to expect at the end of this. So sounds like energy is one of them. Anything else you've seen your patients or from personal experience um, gaining at the end of the 28-day reset? Like, what should I expect? Yeah. At the end of so you definitely gain more energy. You definitely gain more self-confidence in knowing that you can take better care of yourself and that you have to, all the tools you need to do it. And you do lose some things. So you do lose toxins. You do lose some body weight. You do lose some of that, um, that heaviness that we often feel like we're dragging our feet. So those are the things you should be ready to lose. And we're all happy to part with those things. I get to lose that. I don't want any of that anymore. <laughs> Great. Exactly. So there is a lot of benefits. And again, it's customized. It's individualized, right? So all of us are at a different point in our health journey. So what we get out of it is, is going to be different. But what I always say is there's a universal law of karma, right? Like whatever we put into this process is what we gain out of it. So I always ask my patients when they are starting the 28 day reset is that let's be intentional and let's actually do this in a way that we're prioritizing ourselves. So I don't want people to do this just because, Hey, I'm trying to lose a couple of pounds. I'm just doing, trying to do this. It's a great incentive, definitely, but this is so much more than any other detox you've ever done. This is not about just chugging some green juices or taking bottles full of supplements and expecting our body to just magically be different, right? This is a journey. This is a process by which we're unlocking our body's intelligence. So that requires a commitment that requires a, um, a mindful approach. So that's how this thing, this detox or this 20 day reset is very different from what people might have done in the past. Yeah, it sounds like it. Um, can you walk me through what a day looks like in phase one, phase two, phase three, and phase four? Yeah. So the phase one is preparation. And this, I feel like when it is one of the most important parts. Yes, we always focus on detox and everyone wants to kind of just get started with the detox. But the success of the detox really depends on the preparation that we're doing. So our body, we're asking the body to shift gears when we're doing the detox. It's normally used to digesting our food, helping us to go, go, go all day long. And from that, we're telling the body, hey, um, let's do a 180 and let's spend all your time and energy into getting rid of toxins, doing a deep cleaning, give me more energy. Um, and it, it can't just do that overnight. It needs a transition. So to help the body um, detox really well in week two, what we're doing is preparing and we're taking our foot off the gas pedal a little bit. By that, I mean is that we're simplifying, starting to simplify our diet and our lifestyle. So from diet perspective, we start eliminating foods that tend to be very heavy to digest. So I'm not saying these foods are bad, things like gluten, dairy, animal protein. The idea is that um, it takes a lot of body's energy and effort to digest these things. So why don't we do this for the week? Why don't we simplify our diet, focus on more of a plant-based gluten-free diet so that our body can take that extra energy and use it to detox the week after. We're slowly easing into it as the week goes by. And from a lifestyle perspective, what we're doing is coming up with a routine. So we're setting a bedtime for ourselves, we're setting a wake up time and scheduling our meals. And then we're slowly starting to incorporate certain practices such as maybe it's gentle yoga or exercise, starting to experiment with different oral care routines that we'll talk about um, during the 28 day reset. Okay, that sounds doable. <laughs> I'm excited to do it. Um, and I think the only other thing is, I think, and you mentioned in your book is planning the 28 days around a time you're not 
going to be going to major events or being super social. Can you talk a little bit about that in terms of planning and preparation? These 28 days, what we're trying to do is prioritize our self-care. So this is not an ideal time to take a big uh, international trip or attend a lot of, you know, late night events or start running a marathon or anything like that. Our body is using a lot of its energy on detox. So while we're doing it, we have to conserve our energy. And we all know that our social battery can run dry really quickly if we're going to all these events all the time, or if we're traveling, we get jet lagged and tired, get sick often. So let's not waste our body's energy in those things. Let's conserve it and focus on the detox piece. And then just out of here, I like to cook, but how much food preparation goes into this? Because I think that that's like a lot of times the the barrier for a lot of people because, oh, you can't really order out and now you have to prepare your own foods. How, how much of that is part of the detail? If you're someone who is busy or not used to cooking, we can give you all the tools that you need to be able to stick to the diet without um, becoming a, a master chef overnight. Don't worry. So we will give you recommendations from meal de delivery services that can give you gluten-free plant-based options that they can, you can use. We'll also share simple recipes that you can make within 20 minutes that are 20 day reset compliant. And then when it comes to the detox phase, that's when we're really simplifying our diet and eating something called kitchri. So kitchri is a simple rice lentil stew that's used in Ayurveda for thousands of years. And it's a very simple, easy to digest food, yet it is nutritionally complete. It has a carb, a protein, fat. Um, and, and it has the ability to nourish us. So we're not cutting calories. We're not depriving our body. We're basically nourishing it with something that's really, very simple and easy to digest. So kitchri can be a new food. So a lot of people have not heard about it. So we'll give you simple kitchri kit recipes that will, as long as you know how to boil water, you should be able to make it. So that's the only requirement is you need to learn how to boil water. So if you can do that, you can make kitchri. If you are the master chef kind, and if you really want to experiment and get into it, we'll have resources for you to dabble into a more sort of holistic, Ayurvedic style cooking. We've done this so many times with our patients, right? That come from all walks of lives with different, you know, um, ability to cook or different lifestyle choices. So we've done it all. So a lot of the recommendations and resources providing you comes from a place of experience. And again, your success is our success. So we are doing everything we can to make it easy for you, not just to get on this journey, but stay on it and get the maximum benefit that you can get. All right, let's get started. <laughs> <laughs> I have, I did, I think the only other things I wanted to ask were a flexitarian. Mm -hmm. Do you have any recommendations when staying off of animal products, like completely? It's, it's been, you know, I definitely have been more plant-based, especially after learning so much in integrative medicine and, and changing my lifestyle. But it, it is, it is a challenge for a, a lot of patients and including myself. So any recommendations when it comes to that? Because I think that that would be probably one of my major challenges. You have room to customize the diet to a certain degree during the 28 day reset. What I always mm -hmm. say is preserve the seven days of detox. That's when I really ask people to stick to a plant-based diet because that's when the real detox is happening. So when it comes to the preparation phase and reintroduction phase, one of the things I tell people who are missing the, the animal protein is you can turn to broth. So you can use beef broth, you can use bone broths, chicken broth. So you still get the flavor of the meat mm -hmm. while you're cooking a more plant-based meal. So let's say if you're cooking the quinoa, maybe you can do that in a beef broth or a chicken broth. So if we, you know, eliminate the protein part, but still get the taste and flavor from the broths, it's a win-win. When you talk about that, you're doing the 28 day reset, you actually inspire people to say, wait a minute, you know, that's actually a good idea. I'm not feeling that well. I have this brain fog fatigue. So why don't I do this too? So I always say change is infectious. So when you're doing this, when you're showing that commitment to your well-being, you're inspiring other people and you're helping them take better care of themselves. So don't forget that. Um, so be an advocate for your self-care and inspire other people to do the same. So your success is not just your success. It can actually translate into a much bigger impact on all the people that you have around you. Yeah. Let's, I'm, I'm hoping my husband does this with me too. We'll see. I've done other ones before and he's like, uh, no. So like, I'm going to try to show him it's not that hard and it's totally doable. So I can engage him in doing it. My patient always says that the 20th day we said at first, it seemed like, you know, it's a lot of work and everything. But after she did it, she was like, this is my way to never feel guilty about anything. 
um, around the holidays, we eat a lot and we, you know, indulge and we feel horrible about it. So January comes and we're like, oh, what did I do? Why am I here again? Or you go on vacation, you go on a cruise, you go to all inclusive resort and you enjoy your time. You come back and you're like, damn it, why did I do this to myself? So that guilt always takes away all the fun you had and you forget yeah. all the joy and, you know, memories you built in these situations. So she said that 20 day reset was her way of never feeling guilty because she knew that she could be in the moment and enjoy what she was doing, whether it's, you know, enjoying that turkey at Thanksgiving or eating the buffet at all inclusive resort, whatever it was, like I wanted to enjoy that moment and not worry about it because I knew that I have the tools when I go back to bring my body back to balance. So I think that is a transformation we're talking about is that there's no more guilt we are in the mm -hmm. driver's seat finally. Like we have control of our own health destiny and life is ups and downs and recognizing that and not saying that I'm failing or I have, don't have self-control, getting all the negative talk out of it. And instead of saying, hey, I'm in control. I'm gonna choose to do this right now. And I know what I need to do after to come back to balance. So I think that is liberating. And that's also the transformation that we're all looking for. So during these times, um, as, as much as you're trying to avoid social events, things can happen, right? So we don't want you to be a hermit. We don't want you to be a pariah. We want you to still be able to live, live your life. So we'll give you practical tips. So let's say if you are going out to eat for a birthday and if you're doing the 20 day reset, we'll give you tips on what are things you can actually order when you're eating out so that you can still partake, but not go too off course and still stay on your routine. So again, this is all about practical life or we'll give you all the tools that you need. And, and in the meantime, you know, if you feel like, um, you know, th there are instances where you might not be able to continue 20 day reset. So we'll talk th about that too. So let's say all of a sudden you get sick, right? You get COVID, you get a cold or flu or a sinus infection, or for women, if you get your period, what do you do? So we'll go through all these scenarios where if you are sick or if you have your period, you're not feeling that well, or you have to go on an urgent trip or something like that, we'll give you tools how you can pause the 28 day reset and slowly come back to it when you do have the opportunity to resume it. I love that. I mean, that's basically what your whole book is about, is about balance and what intentional health is all about is bringing everything, your whole life and health and well-being into balance, right? And so... I think that that's beautifully said. And I think that that's the goal. We want to be able to enjoy. We want to be able to indulge sometimes and not restrict. And I think that's where a lot of the issues come when people hear resets or they hear, I mean, I know we call it the 28 day reset, but taking away that stigma from the reset is so important um, because these cleanses can be very intense and the, they can be mi quite miserable actually, which is why I'm not a big fan of them and I don't do them. So that's why I'm so excited to, to do this one because I, I've been trying different ones. They just don't really give you that that feeling of some sort of achievement at the end that is possible to do again. You're like, wow, I did that. I don't want to do that again. So, so I, I love this balanced approach to a reset where it's easing your body into it, easing your body out of it because the body loves homeostasis. It is, it does everything to stay in balance naturally. That's like what our mechanisms are made for. And this is just simulating that approach, right? And uh, how the body now functions as opposed to this intense three-day juice cleanse or like 10-day detox where you're, you know, basically not eating anything except celery. I don't know. There's so many things out there. And so this sounds doable. This sounds like it keeps your body and your mind and, and everything in balance, right? Like even taking away the guilt associated with joy, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm, ex I'm excited to see your check in like week two. Yeah, it'll be interesting. I'm not doing this. I want my money back. Together. We all come from yeah. different backgrounds and we have different set of questions and hurdles along the way. So I think this is more about a journey. And I always say it's not about the destination, it is in this process of all about the journey. Because there's things that you learn about yourself. It's really amazing. You know, when you just take the time to pause and look inward you finally establish that connection with your deeper self and actually learn how your body works and listen to those subtle signals that your body's been telling you. Say, like, please pay attention to this. Please do this for me. So when yeah. we're actually listening to it and allowing our body to do what it does best, which is to detox, nourish, and rejuvenate, 
it seems so much more effortless, right? It's actually doing less, not more. You feel better because you're not forcing anything on yourself. You're just letting it happen naturally. So that's the beauty of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me the story of when you had COVID and did Panchakarma. One of the reasons why I drove the 28 day reset was based on my personal experience. So in April, 2020, I'm a doctor in New York City, so a lot of us got pulled to work on the front lines. So I was one of those doctors taking care of very, very sick COVID patients in the ICU, and I was exposed to COVID. I got COVID, and it was a very scary time. We barely knew what COVID was and what to expect from it, so I got really sick, but I didn't have time to really recover, I had to go right back to work. And it wasn't until a month later when I recognized, finally had a moment to pause and say, what's actually going on? I was exhausted. I, my hair was falling out, I was losing weight, no appetite. I was getting short of breath just walking up the stairs. So, so finally I was like, something's not right. Like this is just not getting better. And no one, I, I couldn't turn to anyone because no one knew what was going on with me because now we finally have awareness about what post COVID or long COVID looks like. At that time, no one had any idea. So I was researching online and latest studies and everything, but just there were no answers. So this is when I turned to what I knew can really help me, which is the Eastern medicine approach to how to heal your body. So Panchakarma, it's an ancient detox ritual that's an Ayurveda, traditional Indian medicine, that is part of the overall science of health, where Panchakarma basically means that you're purifying the five elements that make us who we are and that makes everything in the universe. So the idea is you detox on a regular basis to allow for your body to come back to balance. So I said, you know, let's try it. If this can help me, great, but it's definitely worthy of me giving it a shot. And I cannot tell you what a transformative experience that was. Just within one week of having started it, I noticed significant symptoms, symptoms changed. So I was finally having more energy, my appetite somehow returned, my hair stopped falling, um, which was really like, crazy to see that difference from like the week prior. And then towards the end of it, and after a month, I was like, finally started feeling like myself. And I felt like the rejuvenation process carried on for another couple of months. So about three months later, one day I was like, I was going to, and I think finally some of this, um, you know, stores were opening and things like that. And I was like, Oh, let me go. Maybe I'll, I'll buy a new nail polish. I'll do my nails. Then I noticed, wait, I just cut my nails a couple of days ago. And how are they growing back? And that's when I realized that my nails were growing at a rate that I've never grown before. Like literally every few days I was cutting them. And before I could go like two, three weeks without cutting my nails. So I was like, this is just something I'm seeing on the outside. And yes, I'm vain. I want my hair to grow, my nails to grow. But it was just an indication of what transformation had really taken place inside of me. So I couldn't look in and look at my liver or my kidneys or anything like that. But I knew this transformation had taken place. And it took me about a month to do it. So that inspired me to say, okay, why don't I distill this into a sort of a framework that anyone can benefit from so that it's easy, it's accessible, because this knowledge shouldn't be just in the books. It really needs to be out there for people to use, just like I did, to bring their body back to balance and not have to wait to get these severe symptoms that I did. So 28 Day Reset is really inspired from this ancient detox ritual that goes back thousands of years. But not only that, I've added my personal experience to it and experience from thousands of patients that I've seen. So it's a culmination of the science, the, the wisdom, the real life experience to make it easy and accessible to as many people as possible. So that's sort of the behind the scenes story about the 28 day reset. How is the 28 day, uh, day reset different or similar to and different from Panchakarma? Panchakarma, just like any Eastern medicine practice, is highly customized and personalized to the individual doing it in that moment. So, you know, ideally what should happen is you would get an assessment from a, an expert in Ayurveda and Panchakarma. They'll actually look at your overall health assessment and figure out what type of detox ritual makes the most sense for you. Of course, in a book setting or in a general setting, we can't do that. So what we've done is really taken out some of the, the more customized version of it, but what we have focused on instead is the foundational part of it. You know, these are some of the universal things that everyone does during Panchakarma, which is doing less, not more, right? So easing off, simplifying the diet, making sure we're eating foods that are easy to digest, 
making sure we're establishing a daily routine, we're sticking to the routine, and that we're paying attention to our sleep, our bowel movements, our oral health, our mental health, right? So these are just fundamental pieces in Panchakarma that apply to everybody. So the 28 day reset really focuses on those foundational aspects so that once we have the foundation and once we do the 28 day reset, and if you want to go deeper into it, and if you actually want to do the full Panchakarma, you're a much better position to do it. So then you can seek out a provider to do that, but why not at least start building the foundation first that's applicable to everybody. The, the diet is probably the biggest part of that because and maybe you could explain that a little bit more, like what's the reasoning behind the diet recommendations in the book and like, why can't I eat meat? So the, the whole concept about the diet changes in the 28 day reset follows the principle of easing off our digestion or conserving our energy from digestion. So what people don't realize that when we eat a big dinner, let's say we eat, uh, we go out to a steakhouse, we have a big steak, we have a glass of wine, we have some mashed potatoes and bread and all of this. It's not that these foods are bad. Our ancestors have been eating these foods for thousands of years, not that. What also happens is that our ancestors weren't feasting like this every week or every few days, right? That's the difference. So. When we eat meals like that, it takes a lot of energy from our body to be able to digest it, to be able to break, break it down. And when we don't digest it properly, it can actually become problematic. So now I read it, there's a saying that food that is digested properly becomes nutrition and food that is not digested properly becomes toxic and would cause a disease. Food is the same. The last thing we want to do when we're trying to detox is make more mess, right? Create more toxins. So that's the idea behind it is let's simplify our diet so that it's easy to digest. It has nothing to do with, um, you know, what type of protein, how many carbs or anything like that. And the easiest way to think about this is, uh, so when you are sick, when you get the flu, does your body crave a porterhouse steak? Does your body crave ice cream or anything like that? It doesn't, right? What do you crave? You crave a soup. You just want a nice warm bowl of soup. You want maybe just some rice or a banana or something simple, right? So that's exactly what our body's doing. When our body's busy fighting the flu or the virus or an illness, it's saying, let me not use all my energy trying to digest a steak. Why don't we just have a bowl of soup and let me do what I'm trying to do best is trying to get rid of this infection. So it's the same concept where while we're detoxing, we're just giving our body enough time and a break so that we can eat something simple like a soup, stew, um, that's not hard to digest, that's not causing more inflammation in the body, instead it's actually reducing inflammation. So our diet is a way of saying to our body, hey, I'm here to help you. I'm trying to hear, I'm, I'm here to make your job easier. So let me give you foods that are easy to digest and are not causing inflammation. Awesome, yeah, so if I'm hearing you, it's kind of like, what you're saying is our bodies know how to detox themselves already. Is it true that you might get a little sick when you detox or like have withdrawal type symptoms? So when we're detoxing, the body's actually doing a lot of work. It might not seem like it, right? Because you're like, I'm just eating the soup and stew and like, I'm just sitting here journaling or meditating or taking it easy. Like, why do I feel more tired? That's because your body's actually working really hard at detoxing. So while it's releasing the toxins, before you sort of purge them and get rid of them from your body, it might make you a little sick. So you might feel a little more fatigue, a little out of it, a little weaker during the week of detox, but all that's expected, right? Because our body's actually working really, really hard, even though we're physically not doing much. So that's why when we talk about the detox week, we'll, we'll go into more detail about this is the time when you really, you know, this is not the time to do a CrossFit workout. This is the time to do a nice walk, maybe do some yoga stretches, um, just ease off so that your body's not overexerting itself. So this is the time we're simplifying diet, our lifestyle, our exercise, getting more sleep, right? Focusing more on things that are actually supporting our body, helping us rest and rejuvenate. So we'll talk more about the details of the lifestyle component in the detox phase, but that's the overall concept. Let's just take it easy. Let's just allow our body to recover and detox and not get in the way. Yeah. I mean, cause like a lot of the people that I follow, like the Huberman lab and stuff, you know, they're telling me to do like 72 hour fat, like water fasts, you know, like if, if, if you're saying that like if we, the animal proteins are complex to digest and we're like, you know, like kind of like you're saying that, well, why not take it to the extreme? Yeah. So I know that's a very uh, Western approach, right? We want to do it fast. We want the bigger, best, right? Everything is fast and instant gratification. I wish things worked that way. 
So what I'm sharing here in 28 Day Reset is not Dr. Parikh some magic detox program. That's not what this is. This is based on 5,000 years of science and understanding how the body really works. I went to medical school for over a decade and I've seen thousands of patients. And I always tell people that my experience and my training are not there to tell me what to do because sometimes ChatGPT can probably do a better job than me. But my training and my experience educates me and equips me with the knowledge I need to know what not to do, right? Understanding when not to do something takes way more experience and training than telling people what to do. So the 28 day reset is not just a, a whimsical like idea that I read some study, I'm telling people to do these crazy things. It's actually a very thoughtful, intentional process that's based on science, ancient wisdom, and tons of real life experience. So. I have seen people who have done, you know, very aggressive detoxes from coffee enemas to prolonged fast and really, um, you know, major diet changes overnight. And these are when they come to me, I see the negative effects of it. These are not publicized. These are not pe what people are talking about on Instagram, right? They're not, they're posting like their 20 pound weight loss or something very episodic and very specific that might happen for some people, but they're not really sharing the, the side effects or negative consequences of these aggressive measures. So when we're talking to a wider audience, we have to be very mindful in making sure that what we're sharing is actually applicable to everyone who's listening, that we're not doing any harm. The first oath that we take as doctors is do no harm. So I encourage people to take advice, especially health advice from people who are doing this day in day, day out, they have the training and the real life experience to tell you what to do and what not to do. So that's the big difference. Yeah. Okay. I hear you. Cause like, um, I definitely agree. Like the Western programming, right? Like most people, when they try to detox, it's kind of like they're, they're so guilty about all the toxing they've done. So they immediately like psychologically, it feels better just to rush into something that's too extreme. And then it's like what you say in the book, it doesn't actually make sense because then your body's working double time to process those supplements and it's usually counterproductive. And it sounds like that says like you, you've seen that. So you're this process you're proposing and Pancha Karma, like, is it scientific? Is there a science of detoxification? I know Western medicine often doesn't talk about detox as like an actual mechanism, but it uses different words to describe it. So what happens is when we're eating certain types of diets every single day, uh, when we're stressed, we're not getting enough sleep, we're exposed to environmental toxins, what happens is that our body starts getting more and more inflamed, right? So all of these diet, normal like diet, lifestyle things, stress, everything manifests in our body as inflammation. And Western medicine now validates that and says inflammation is the root cause of pretty much every disease that we're looking at. So where does this inflammation come from? How does it come about? It doesn't happen overnight, right? It's obviously related to our diet, our lifestyle, our sleep, stress level, whether we exercise or not. So all these domains of our well-being are directly affecting our health overall. So what Eastern medicine is basically saying is why wait till this inflammation sets in and becomes disease? Why don't we intervene early on and optimize our diet, our lifestyle, take the time to reduce that inflammation from time to time, which is what Panchakarma really is, so that these diseases don't come about. So it's a preventive approach. It's looking at how, ways to prevent inflammation in the first place, where Western medicine really excels at looking at the inflammation after it's taken place and become a disease. So we're just looking at the, the spectrum of health to disease. Eastern medicine excels at the first half, where it focuses on prevention, and Western medicine excels at after the disease is already set in. So my message is, this is all scientific, right? We need more attention to the preventive part and Eastern medicine just does a better job at it. So we're emphasizing more of that in the 28 day reset. Gotcha. Yeah. So, um, going back to the diet a little bit, you know, you said that we can't eat animal products, but I keep seeing the word exception ghee. What's ghee and why is it important in Panchakarma? Ghee is clarified butter. So the way it's made is actually you heat up uh, butter. And then as it's heating up, it separates. So there are some milk solids that will sink on the bottom. And there is this clear yellow looking um, like oil that floats up to the top. And that's what ghee is. So the idea is that when you're making ghee, the clarified butter part, you're taking out the actual milk solids. You're removing a lot of the casein protein that might cause more inflammation in the body. And that's much harder to digest. So what you're doing is you're breaking down the butter into 
parts that are really good for us, easy to digest, and removing the parts that can potentially cause inflammation. Another important difference between butter and ghee is that ghee can stay be shelf stable, so you don't have to put it in the fridge. It can just stay out. But obviously, we know that butter and yogurt or milk cannot stay out. And Ayurveda actually takes it one step further and says that ghee actually has a lot of gut health benefits. So in traditional panchakarma, you actually end up drinking, we're not doing this in 28 day reset, but for some people in Panchakarma, you actually drink ghee on an empty stomach. And the idea is that it's actually coating the inside of the gut lining and helping it rebuild and rejuvenate. Now, Western medicine is validating that. So ghee is one of the few foods that actually have something called high levels of short chain fatty acids. And one of them is butyrate. So butyrate is essentially a fatty acid that we cannot make. We rely on the gut bacteria to make it for us by digesting fiber. And what the butyrate does, it acts as fuel for the, the cells inside our gut and helps them rebuild, repair, and heal much faster. So, you know, Ayurveda figured that out thousands of years ago and said, if we actually fast and clean out our gut and then we drink the ghee, it will increase the amount of this butyrate and help the gut heal much faster. So that's the, the beauty of it. It's like, it's everything that is put into this 28 day reset and panchakarma is actually extremely scientific. And our science might just lag in a few years um, to actually recognize some of the health benefits that are built into this ritual. More like thousands yeah, of years. <laughs> thousands, thousands of years, years perhaps, yeah. You know, it's like cool and interesting. And we're trying to do the research on all the stuff that's been discover thousands of years ago, which is fascinating. Yeah. yeah well, that's my attitude about all this biohacking stuff. You know, it pisses me off because it's like bro science and it's like the finance fratty guys, you know, why can't it just be from Eastern wisdom? Why does you have to rediscover it and why you have to hack nature? Like, oh, you're hacking her. Like, why can't you respect nature? Is that really that crazy? The hacks and everything, I think they still serve a purpose. It allows people to ease into the understanding of it. And then once they see a difference, then they take a deeper dive into like the Eastern origins of it. So I'm not against hacks because I think I'm able to give them an easy, digestible manner of doing something for their health you know, taking into consideration, because it's different. Thousands of years ago, they didn't have internet. They didn't have these 60 hour jobs. They didn't have all of the like traffic mm -hmm. and other things to worry about. You know what I mean? Like it was a little bit different. Your life's dedication was to all, all of it mm -hmm. sort of tied in nature, food, community, all uh -huh. these things and to be able to do these practices on a regular basis and that intensely. I think in society now we have trouble doing that because society is full of other external pressures from a lot of people don't mm -hmm. have community. You know, there are people who have, you know, children and don't have the help. So how are they going to, you know, spend hours doing yoga? It's, it's not realistic. And so I think what the 28 day reset is doing and what a lot of these hacks are doing is allowing, um, people to be healthy within the context of the limitations society has placed on us. And I think that that's really important to recognize because yeah, would I love to meditate for an hour in the morning and like, you know, prepare all my foods from scratch. I would love to do that, but I've got to figure out, you know, I got to get my daughter ready before I start work at 9 a.m. So it's, it's difficult, you know? And so I think that there's still a lot of value in, in hacks or, 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 I, you know, we call them shortcuts. They're not really shortcuts, but but digestible and small actions that can lead to big changes over time. I think you were talking more about like hacks as in tips and like giving them actionable things to focus on, not just get overwhelmed yeah. by the information. Um, and I think mm -hmm. Zach, you earlier, you talked about the whole biohacking movement. And that's really very, very interesting how people have made that into their like uh, source of income by just telling people how to like be smarter than their own body. Um, but yeah, that's a very stark contrast between the 28 day reset and some of these biohacking things. And in the book, I actually talk about the story of the 185 yogi. So if talk about the ultimate biohacking, right? So how did this yogi <laughs> manage to live for 185 years? And there's even some pictures of it. And, and the book I read talks about the process and he did the process called Kaya Kalpa, which has been around for thousands of years. Again, it's sort of like Panchakarma, like on a different level that was reserved for these advanced yogis. And when I talk about advanced yogis, like this yogi would meditate in 
in Himalayas with sub-zero temperature while wearing a, a loincloth for, for years. But they had advanced knowledge of how to hack the body to be able to survive longer. And they practice these sciences of Kaya Kalpa, which basically means they figured out how to activate their stem cell. And we know the stem cells can essentially become any part of the body, right? Our stem cells can turn into new teeth, new hair, new skin, new liver. We're growing livers in lab now by using stem cells. We're curing cancers by using stem cells. So we know the power of stem cells. So the yogis just figured out how to tap into it. Um, in a different way for to, to be able to live a long, healthy life so they can continue spiritual progress. So it's not that they biohacked anything. What they did, they just unlocked their body's ability to do superhuman things that we're all capable of and did it in a way that protected its integrity, that protected and respected the, the science and the nature, the natural laws. We're not defying the natural laws in any of this. We're simply sort of experiencing and manifesting them in a different level. So I think that's the contrast. When Science of Kaya Kalpa is all about respecting the nature and the natural laws and sort of abiding by them in a completely different way versus biohacking, for me, it tends to be the attitude that the body is stupid and we need to tell it what to do. It's doing something wrong. Let me fix it. And I'm smarter than the millions of years of evolution, evolutionary intelligence that's in our DNA. So I think that's the fundamental difference. And again, there are people who want those quick fixes and they want to do those aggressive fasts, and that's totally fine. But I want to highlight that this intentional health is a platform for people who really want to take a deeper dive, who want to combine the best of East and Western medicine and still embrace the, the common sense approach to health and well-being and be able to fit it into their daily life, right? Like not all of us can do these crazy fasts and like go do plunge pools and have like a million dollar sauna in their house, right? We can't, not all of us can do those things. So let's figure out hacks and simple ways to incorporate some of these basic fundamental knowledge into our busy, crazy lives and still get benefit from it. Okay. Uh, to change gears a little bit, you know, why did you choose herbs like triphala and total body cleanse? for the 20 day reset that you have in your book. So some of these herbs are used because it does follow the, the traditional panchakarma approach to detox. And also the good thing about these herb combinations is that it can fit, it's fit for anyone. So in our way, there's a concept that we all have different constitution or something called dosha. So some people are something called vata dosha, pitta and kapha dosha. So we all have different tendencies essentially. And not all herbs work best. So I can take one herb and it can be good for me. But if you take it, that might have a slightly different effect on you. So, so that's the reason why we're picking herbs that are suitable for anyone to take them and can have a very positive effect. And we don't worry about those side effects. So that's why these herbs are chosen in a very thoughtful manner to make sure we're not doing any harm, but we're actually unlocking their benefit and having the biggest impact for basically anyone who takes them. Okay. And then it seems like kind of like you, we increase the doses of them during the detox period. I'm assuming that's because it strengthens it the other processes that we're going to be doing during that time? Yeah, that's a very good observation. So the reason we're upping the dose of some of these herbs and during detox phase is like I said, that's when we're really simplifying our diet and lifestyle. So we have more energy um, for our body to be able to focus on detox. So we're supporting it by adding some more herbs, increasing their dose so we can really go deeper into the detox and facilitate that process naturally. So that's the difference between the 28 day reset or the Ayurvedic approach of doing this versus some of these biohacking approaches, right? More is not always better. So if you take a lot of herbs at a point where your body is still inflamed and still trying to digest a big meal, the herbs are not really going to work that well. In fact, it might actually overwhelm your liver. Just taking 20 supplements doesn't mean you're getting benefit from it. It can actually harm you. So that's the reason we have thoughtfully curated how you're taking these herbs, what amount, what type of herbs, and how we adjust the dose to match what, you're able, what your body is actually able to process and get the most benefit out of that.